So I hope you're exploring uh, possibly that, that maybe to you a new song when we are tested and wrestled alone. Now, this is all about Jesus' time in the wilderness, of course, but we're just going to go back a little bit because when Jesus was baptised in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, he saw heaven torn open and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. You remember that? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And he also heard his father's voice. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now how do you follow that? Well, we find out in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 1, and verse 12 to 15. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe the good news. Amen. Amen. As soon as I say those words, trust and obey, I'm pretty sure that many of you have immediately got a certain hymn in your heads, and perhaps you've even begun to sing it. But just bear with me for a few minutes, and you will get your chance, I promise. When We Walk With The Lord used to be a hymn that I used to think was a little bit of Victorian sentimentality. But as I've matured, dare I say, as a Christian, and actually look carefully at the words, I've come to realise why it's so popular. It was written around 1886. Dwight L. Moody, probably better known as D. L. Moody, was leading a series of his gospel missions in Massachusetts. At one of the meetings, it said that a young man got up and said, I am not quite sure, but I am going to trust and I am going to obey. It was a man called Daniel Brink Towner who told the story to his friend J. H. Samis, a Presbyterian minister, who promptly wrote the chorus and then wrote the verses. Towner then wrote the tune and ever since the words and the tune have been inseparable. The young man who declared his willingness to trust and obey, even in the face of uncertainty, took a wonderful, a wonderful step of faith. Have a look at the hymn and just look at the words. When the hymn speaks of burdens and sorrow, of toil, of grief and loss, and then of a cross, all being blessed as we trust and obey, we begin, I think, to see something of Jesus' experience in the wilderness and throughout his ministry. Jesus laid everything on the altar, as the hymn suggests we do, even his life, as he trusted himself to his Father in faithful, trusting obedience. Becoming a Christian and being filled with the Holy Spirit and then being tested, tempted and often having to suffer as you obedient, obediently get on with witnessing, well that was almost an everyday story for those who were reading Mark's Gospel. Mark wrote some 30 or so years after Jesus' death and resurrection. In fact daily regular persecution was the experience of the church for the first 300 years of Christianity until the Emperor Constantine came along of course and that is still the same for many Christians in many countries today of course baptised by water and then by the Holy Spirit into Christianity from Judaism, from other faiths, from paganism or from no religion at all Christians then and now were and are immediately in danger of persecution and even death the trials, testing and persecution Christians suffered was a type of wilderness experience. Would their faith, their willingness to trust and obey God, stand up to the test? More often, thank God, it did than it didn't. Their faith was proved and tested in the fire of persecution. But they were always ready to proclaim and to share the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. Such was their trust, and such was their willingness to be obedient to God's call. For me, and I hope for you, the question then arises, can I, as many Christians do today, identify with Jesus' willingness to trust 
and obey? Can I possibly live in the same way? Let's just return to that short Bible passage to help us along the way. You know, please notice that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested, to be tried. The Greek word that's used there can mean all three of those things. Jesus didn't seek this experience. But he was faced with the question, how would he use his power? And when we look at Matthew's Gospel and Matthew's account of the temptations, we see that Jesus had to make lots of decisions. How would he, would he trust? And would he be obedient to God? It was a question that he faced many times during his ministry. You know, when, when he was there in the desert, in the wilderness, would he set up a kingdom by force as Satan wanted him to do? Or would he seek to set up a reign of love, even if it led to a cross? As we think about the other times in his ministry, there are lots of examples. Remember how his family wanted to take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. The people of Nazareth, people that Jesus had grown up with, refused to believe him. Peter tried to dis persuade Jesus that he would never suffer and die. No, oh, it will never happen. And Jesus said, of course, get behind me, Satan. Judas Iscariot betrayed him. Peter then denied knowing him. And Jesus was left alone. Alone, to stand before the power of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. He was left alone to face Pilate and Herod, and then he was tortured, nailed to a cross, and forsaken by God. And in each of these experiences, and there were many more besides, all of them were times of testing, times of temptation. Each time Jesus had to decide, <coughs> excuse me, would he trust and obey God, or would he give in to his family, to his friends, to Caiaphas, to Pilate, to Herod, even to the soldiers? Would he go home with his mum? Would he listen to Peter? And ultimately, would he save himself from death? Every time, Jesus chose to trust and obey God. I wonder at which point I would have decided to give in to the temptation and to pack it all in and go home. At which point would I have said, I give in, I surrender, I failed the test, the temptation to stop is far too great. Now we need to be careful here with our use of words. I mentioned earlier that test, trial and temptation are all possible translations of the one Greek word. So we need to make sure that we understand how we're using the English words. There are two kinds of temptation. The first comes from within us. Because of our sinful nature we're tempted to say and do things that go against God. We all know that temptation and Paul gives us <coughs> Excuse me. Paul gives us a long list in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. And they include sinful ambition, uh, sorry, selfish ambition, envy, lust, and rage. And I wonder how many of those I can identify with. Uh, quite a few, I think. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all warn us to pray that we will not enter into temptation by our own carelessness or disobedience. But thankfully, if we do, when we do, God, who is faithful, always provides a way of escape or gives us the strength to endure it, as we read in Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. Remember, to be tempted is not a sin. It's good to know that Jesus was tempted, but he, of course, never succumbed to any of the temptations. He never said, I give in, I'm going on. So the first kind of temptation is that which comes from within us. The second kind of temptation is better called a trial or a test. Sometimes we are tested by God, as Jesus was. And that's to test our faith so that we can grow as Christians. It sounds a little bit uh, tough, but this is important. When I was in the sixth form at school, I played for the rugby third 15, for the rugby third team. And one day I was promoted to the second team. At first, I was very fearful of being dropped again, of failing the trial. But then I decided to obey my teachers, to trust their judgment and my ability, to try and make the first team. It was a test, 
but it was a great opportunity to further improve my skills. And one day I got the call and I played for the first team. Only the ones mind, but I did make it. Now to change the sport, all mountaineers begin on small rock faces. Even those who climbed Everest started on something small. Each new rock face is a more difficult test, requiring new skills, building on what they already know. To watch a great mountaineer on a severe rock face is nothing but awesome. To meet a Christian who has great faith is equally awesome and I could name you many that I've met and had the privilege of meeting in my ministry. In my own small way on the rugby field, the mountaineer conquering Everest and the Christian of great faith, success has only come because we were tried, we've been tested. All Christians go through times of testing which come in all sorts of guises. Persecution, tragedy, personal illness, times of worry and doubt, times when God seems a long, long way away. The list just could go on and on and on, couldn't it? And each experience can leave you feeling as though you're in a kind of a wilderness. And sometimes God sends us into the wilderness. At other times we end up there because something happens that we have no control over. Either way, we can feel terribly lost and very alone. Temptation from within, temptation from without. Both can be used by God to strengthen us, to increase our faith, to bring us closer to God. I wonder if you can give thanks for some of those times. Look back for a moment at your life. Maybe do it later, but and bring, bring to mind times when God felt far away, times when you were under pressure. Times when you felt like you were being tested. What did you learn? Did your faith grow stronger because of your experience? Are you now able to face even greater trials, even greater challenges, even greater tests? I remember one church member who came to me and said that no matter how much she prayed, she still felt that God was a long way away, like her prayers were coming back off the ceiling. What was my advice? To keep on praying to don't give up, to trust and obey. In all of these situations, at all of these times, in all of these trials, and all of these tests, Jesus has been there. He's experienced it. Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, blazed a trail of trust and obedience which provides the basis of our salvation. His times of testing, of suffering, and his death were all for us so that we too can face everything that life throws at us even death itself. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can trust and obey. And this can be a hard lesson to learn. We can be so worried that we forget to pray. We can feel so sorry for ourselves that we forget to take our eyes off ourselves and instead look to God. We can be so sure that we've been abandoned that we are ready just to give up and go on. Much there is so much that can, go, <coughs> that can come between us and God. But the answer is always to be faithful. To pray when you don't feel like praying. To worship when you'd rather be somewhere else. To praise when things are tough. To focus on the times when you knew God was close. Remember those times. Hold on to them. And never, ever let them go. All of this is summed up, and more besides, summed up by saying that when we're in the wilderness, we must trust and obey. Easier said than done, I know. But always, always keep your eyes fixed on the God who loves you. Because in all things, he loves you. Only through the sufferings and glory of Jesus can you and I be all that God created us to be. Jesus shared our suffering and our death so that we can share his glory. So we've begun our journey with Jesus through Lent towards the cross. Sometimes we may find ourselves saying with the young man in Massachusetts, I am not quite sure, but I am going to trust and I am going to obey. So let us walk 
in the light of so let us walk with the Lord in the light of his word and let us trust and obey Amen and now's your chance you can sing that wonderful hymn when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word let's trust and obey and then to lead us into our prayers there's a, a chorus which is a beautiful worship chorus and it's simply I love you Lord so enjoy both of those hymns and I'll see you on the other side <laughs> 